Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, it says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment, with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, here we are on Father's Day, and here's the address to fathers. And ye fathers, verse 4, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. As we look at the context here, we see the Apostle Paul is closing out his letter to the church at Ephesus. Ephesus is a wicked city full of temples and dedicated to gods and goddesses, full of hatred and persecution for believers that were there in that city and the church. But we see Paul's final instructions as he wraps up this letter. Uh, they're not about fighting a culture war. He's not admonishing them about the Great Commission and their duty to preach to unbelievers. He's not challenging them about how they can change the people around them or be a light in their community, although that's important. That's not what he's saying to this church at this time. Here, Paul wraps up the letter with instructions for the believer's walk. He's telling believers how to conduct themselves, how to act right for themselves. He talks about our spirit. He talks about the things that we need to avoid and why. He talks about the wrath of God. He talks about our fellowship and who we ought to and ought not to spend time with. He talks about being filled with the Spirit of God. But then we see him shift gears and he starts into these instructions for various relationships. As you look at this, this passage, you kind of see a progression. You, you see, he's talking about their conduct. He's talking about the way that they uh, ought, ought to live. But sometimes it's easy for us to think about our conduct in the abstract. You know, we know that we ought to love. We know that we ought to have joy in our lives. We know that we ought to live with peace and long-suffering and gentleness and kindness and purity. And you fill in all the blanks, all these fruits of the Spirit and all these different things that we as believers ought to have in our lives. And we know we need more of it. But if we're going to live out these ideals in the real world, there has to be an application of these concepts. And where better to start than in our relationships? Where do we live out that love? Where do we live out that long-suffering and that joy and that peace? But in our relationships, and we see in Ephesians chapter 5 and uh, verse 22, and 22 on through 33, he says, he talks about the, the marriage relationship, the relationship between the husband and the wife. And it always cracks me up in my Bible. I, I don't have a lot of notes, but there are little headers over different sections. And it says, you know, in that section, it says, walk not as fools in verse 15. And then in verse 22 there, it says, instructions for marriage. <laughs> so I don't know if they tied those two together exactly, but, but there's some good instruction there about marriage. Then we see where we were reading today in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1 through 4, the parent-child relationship. We see it teaching about obedience and then nurturing on the other side. We see as we progress there, verse 5 through 9, we see the employer-employee relationship, the servant and the the master. We see the call for obedience and service and goodwill and respect. And then finally, we know this passage well, we see that relationship between the believer and Satan. That relationship is one of battle, we see in the, the armor of God. He talks about this here. But today, I want to zoom in on this family relationship, and, and specifically that of the parent and child. And I'll start out and just say that the family unit and relationships within the family are extremely important. Uh, it is extremely important, not just because of the effects of those relationships. We don't live a pragmatic religion. We live by faith. We don't just look at the effects, but there are some effects when we forsake the unit and the family and the relationships and the plan that God has for it. You know, there are effects on emotional well-being that even our world recognizes today. You know, look at the emotional intelligence and the character of our society. Look at empathy and compassion. Look for awareness and concern for the needs of others. Look at the self-control or lack of it that we see in our society today. Look at the uh, inability to apologize or inability to accept criticism. And these are things that are learned within the family unit if we follow God's instructions. These are pragmatic things that come from following what God calls us to do. And as important as all these things are, as important as it is to be emotionally 
healthy and emotionally well. That's not the primary reason that we need a proper understanding of God and his plan for the family. No, the real reason that we need to understand God and his plan for the family is because he uses this relationship as a picture of our relationship with God the Father. I'm going to say that again. He uses this illustration of the family and our relationship with our father or our relationship with our children as an illustration of his relationship as God the Father. Ephesians chapter 5, turn there and look at Ephesians chapter 5, just back just a page there or maybe on the same page. It says, Be ye therefore followers of God, say those last three with me, as dear children. As dear children. In the same way that, that children are supposed to follow their fathers, we are supposed to follow our Heavenly Father. And I'll say it as I, I want to make sure we lay out every message and every time the Word of God is open, if you have put your faith, not put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you do that today. Do that as soon as possible. Come to Him. You can know that He is your Father. But when you put your faith and trust in Christ for salvation, the Bible tells us that you are a child of God. And I'll say you can't sneak into the family of God. You can't earn your way into the family of God. You can't work your way into the family of God. Ye must be born again, the scripture says. Not of water, but the Bible says of the Spirit of God. In that same passage in John chapter 3 where he lays that out and uses that illustration about being born again, it, it, it gives us that verse, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth, in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And I'll say, if you're born into the family of God, by putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you are a child of God. You can follow him as a dear child, as it says here in Ephesians chapter 5. I praise the Lord for the family that I was born into. What a blessing it was. I tell folks that I was in church from the time I was negative nine months old because my parents, they were faithful in the house of God. But that didn't make me a Christian. It didn't, it didn't make me a Christian because I grew up in the nursery and I learned scripture verses and I was in Sunday school and I, I brought a little offering as a child. No, those things didn't make me a Christian any more than, as Billy Sunday said, being in a, in a, a car repair shop makes you an automobile. You know, no, at one point I had to be born into the family of God for myself. And I remember that one Wednesday evening on a, 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 a November evening, the night, the night before Thanksgiving. And I remember that service where I came home that night and the Holy Spirit of God was working in my heart and my life, convicting me. And I knew, I, I had grown up in church. I, I, I was the, the, the church brat, however you want to put it. I, I, I was that person, but I knew that if I was to die, I was on my way to an eternity in hell. And I came home and on our, our little couch, it was a, a, a metal couch, a wire frame with, with uh, couch cushions that sat on it there. I knelt on the edge of our couch and I prayed and I trusted Jesus Christ as my personal savior. And he, he answered my prayer. He saved me. And I've had that confidence since that point. And whether or not I have confidence, he saved me. He gave me eternal life. But I've had the confidence since that point that if I was to die, if anything was to happen, I know for sure that I would be on my way to heaven. Not because I worked, not because I earned it, not because of the family that I grew up into, but because I was born again into the family of God by faith in Jesus Christ alone. And I can sing now, I can sing that song, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Amen. And that's the picture that he uses here. A family, the family of God. And if we want to understand how to follow God, our Heavenly Father, we have to learn from his instructions for the family. And I'll say here, you know, we talk about the positive. If we're going to follow God in the way that he wants, we follow his instructions. On the negative side, when we fail to understand his instructions, we are going to fail in our relationship with the Heavenly Father. And I don't think it's hard for us to look around and see that our society is full of dysfunctional families. It's full of dysfunctional families. We see divorce and broken homes and uh, children that are, are not cared for. And, and we see the dysfunction of our homes. And it, it is a natural progression that when God uses that as the illustration of his relationship with the believers, that we have a world that is also filled with dysfunctional worship with dysfunctional followers of Jesus Christ. He tells them here in Ephesians 5, 1, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. This family relationship is a picture for the believers to follow. It's an illustration, a pattern for us to continue in. When it comes to this 
parent-child relationship, we find much instruction throughout the Bible. I love Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he shall not depart from it, will not depart from it. Proverbs 13, 24 says, He that spareth the rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. You could put a she in there too, I know. In Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 6 and 7, it says, And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And we see throughout the scriptures there are instructions for teaching and training the children. There are instructions for discipline and chastisement. We see instructions for the spirit and manner in which all of this is to, done, uh, to be done. And today I want to look at some instructions that are given specifically to fathers. Some instructions that are given specifically to fathers. And I think this will be a help to anyone who listens because it relates to how we interact and relate with our Heavenly Father. But let's look back in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4. It says, And ye fathers... There's a specific address to fathers. Here, the responsibility is laid at the feet of the fathers and ye fathers. I can almost imagine, you know, that, that big bony pointing finger, you know, pointing out at, at, the, at the fathers and ye fathers. He points at, at, at these men and says, you know, this is specifically for you. There are many in our society today that look at child rearing as a mother's job. They like to pawn it off on mom. You know, she's the one that spends the time with the kids. She's the one that takes care of that. That's not a manly thing. That's not something that I want to be a part of. And I'll say that, yes, the mother plays an essential role in rearing children. That is absolutely true. But ultimately, the Bible tells us that there are some responsibilities in child rearing that rest on the shoulders of the father. And ye fathers. The mother is the heart of the home, I like to say, but the father is the head. And ye fathers. And I'll say here, fathers, we cannot neglect the great responsibility that God has laid upon us. There's no wiggling out of it. There's no delegating our way out of it. There's no shoveling it off onto someone else or an education system or, or their mother or society in general. But the scriptures call for the father to bring up his children in the way of the Lord. But I praise the Lord that God doesn't just leave us there to figure it out on our own. Once again, he gives us specific instruction in the word of God here. He, he, he gives us through, throughout the Bible, but here in this verse, I see six helpful commands that I want to look at. I don't believe I'm going to make through them all today here, but, but we're going to start on these here. The first thing we see in this verse, in verse chapter, chapter 6, verse 4, it says, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. Provoke not. The first command, the first instruction that we see here is, to provoke not your children to wrath. This word provoke means to arouse to a feeling or action. In this case, when it talks about provoke, to extreme anger, wrath, or vengeful anger. Now, he's just gotten done explaining that there is a special blessing for the child that honors their father and their mother. It says there in verse 2, Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. He explains the, the blessing that, that comes from this honoring. They're going to live long. They're going to be blessed. It says there, you know, that it may be well with thee. These are some wonderful things. But now he, he gets done addressing the children and he turns to the father and he says here, don't give your child valid reason for this vengeful anger. Don't provoke them. Make sure that you do your part to make sure they can do that. God commands the child, the young person, to honor their father and mother. But parents, let them do that. Don't provoke them to anger. Don't provoke them in the way that God talks about here. I'll ask you, and I think that most everyone here has at some point been in a conflict of some sort. I think that it's a clear thing. And if you're attempting to accomplish something that's profitable, any sort of endeavor in life, you're going to encounter conflict. There are going to be people that don't like what you're doing. There's going to be people that, that are going to try and stop it in some way. It, it's unavoidable in life for there to be clashes of will. There will be struggles. There will be pressure and force. And you look at the child rearing of relationship. The Bible talks about, and we'll mention this in a minute, uh, there's foolishness in the heart of a child. And when that foolishness encounters a parent who is uh, living by the wisdom that is found in the word of God, that foolishness and that wisdom, they're going to butt heads. 
there is going to be some conflict. And as the parent, thank the Lord, he made us bigger than children. He made us so that we can force our will on them. There's a biblical way to do this. We're not going into all of that right now, but there's going to be conflict. And in these conflicts, I'm going to say it is possible to win a contest without provoking, without provoking. If you've ever been in any sort of sporting endeavor, maybe you've got up and you've boxed. And let me say, I think every, every young man should box at some point. You know, it's good sometimes to get hit upside the head and try to figure out which direction your opponent even is. You know, you're turning backwards and, you know, it, it's a good thing. But, but you get up there and, and, and you get in a, in a boxing fight and, and you do your best. You, you try to, you know, get more hits on the opponent than the other person. You, you try, to, try to win that contest. But in that contest, you can, you can get in a boxing match without getting angry. You can get in a boxing match and win that boxing match without making it personally personal and provoking, without yelling insults or spitting on them or whatever. You can, you can win a conflict without provoking someone. And I'll say that in our rearing of children, in our discipline, in our bringing them to where God wants them to be, as parents, we have to be careful that we win, that we do what's right without provoking. It's possible if we have humility. And I cannot say... I cannot overstate the importance of humility in raising children. Humility. There has to be humility. If we, if we come at this as, it's, as if it's an ego contest, if it's, as if this is something that we are trying to prove that we are right, that, that we are bigger, that we know better, and we do. You know, we, we're living according to this. We have more truth, but we're not perfect. We need to approach this work that God has called us to do with humility. And I'll say, Father, there will be contests of will. There will be times when you have to stand up for what's right. You have to say, no, we won't do that. You're, there are going to be times when you're going to have to drag your children to do whatever they need to do. And there are going to be times that you have to force them. But do it with humility. And the Bible says here, provoke not your children to wrath. Proverbs 22 and verse 4 gives us the general command. He says, by humility and fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. Don't give your kids an ang- a reason for anger. Don't give them an excuse. Don't provoke them. We see a similar passage in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 21. It says, Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. This is similar in context, uh, similar context to that letter in, um, in uh, Ephesians here. But here there there's an addition. There's a reason given. It says we don't want to see children discouraged. And I'll say, Fathers, God resisteth the proud, but he gives grace unto the humble. And if we want to see God bless our children, if we want to see him bless our administration of his principles and the things that he wants us to teach him, we have to do it in humility. Fathers, when was the last time that you apologized to your child when he was wrong or she was wrong or when you were wrong? The opposite way. I'm trying to say this right. When was the last time that you apologized to a child when you were wrong? I don't know about you, but I never, I never, uh, I made some mistakes. I made some assumptions and I walked up to my boys and heard them with a loud voice and, and thought they're arguing, what's going on here? <laughs> you know, I've come into those situations and I've seen someone with something I've, I've made assumptions and I've been wrong and I've had to apologize. No, I'm sorry. There have even been times when I've disciplined my children and found out something later that was not the way that I thought it was. And I've had to apologize. You know what? A parent that lives in pride and according to his own ego is just going to ignore those things. He finds that out, he's going to walk right on by. That is provoking your child to wrath. Show some humility. We need to make sure our children know uh, that they obey and do what is right, not because we need to win an ego battle, not because we need to be the one that's right, but because we ourselves are being obedient to our Heavenly Father who commands us to teach these things to our children. Stand up for what's right without provoking. Do it with humility, and you have the ability to encourage or discourage your children. We see the first thing that it commands us here as fathers is provoke not. Provoke not. The second thing we see here in verse 2, in verse 4, it says, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up. Bring them up. And I'll mention here, first of all, there's a difference between bringing and sending. I believe it in every word Bible. I believe that every word that we see in the scripture is there for a reason. It was not put there idly. It was not put there without purpose. And it says here, bring them up. 
And there's a difference between bringing someone and sending someone. When you bring someone, you're standing alongside them. When you bring someone, you're there with them. When you send them, you're not next to them. And the question here today is, are you bringing your children? We've seen it on the bus routes. I, you go out and you knock in some areas and there are parents that they want their kids to go to church, but they themselves don't want to go to church. Oh, kids, you need to go to church. Oh, you need to go ahead and memorize those verses. You need to go and do these things. Well, what about you, parent? Are you bringing them or are you sending them? Dads, we need to go with them. We need to bring them. And the question here is, are we bringing our children? When it comes to the word of God, when it comes to reading the Bible, are we bringing them or are we saying, hey, kids, you need to read the Bible. You need to spend time in God's word. When it comes to prayer, are you bringing them? Are you saying, hey, you need to spend time in prayer? Or are you yourself spending time in prayer? Have your kids ever found you on your knees, spending time talking to the Lord? When it comes to Bible memory, I know. Kids have an advantage when it comes to Bible memory. They do. But it's a scriptural command. We're supposed to hide the word of God in our hearts. And that's not something that goes away when you reach a certain age, when you have kids. No, we're supposed to bring them alongside us. When it comes to working hard, when it comes to living holy, when it comes to giving, when it comes to showing love and kindness, when it comes to honesty and telling the truth and our value for the truth, are we bringing our children or are we sending them on to do something that we're not doing ourselves? And I'll say it is a good thing to desire for your children to do more and to go further than you. But parents, that's no excuse for sending them on to do something that you yourself are not even attempting to do. I love it when I, I love when I go out to a door and I spend time with someone else that that says something. Maybe they they have a better um, verse that they're able to answer with, or they have a better way of saying something. And I say, Man, I didn't even teach them that, but I'm trying to grow. I'm trying to continue. I'm bringing someone with me. I love seeing my sons. My daughter will soon be at that point where they excel even beyond what what I do in certain areas. But that doesn't mean that I stop trying. That doesn't mean that I'm not trying to bring them with me. Fathers, be the leader. Set the right example. Bring your children. Take them under your wing. Bring them up. Not only do we see that we're supposed to provoke not our children, we're supposed to bring them with us, but we see here that we're supposed to raise them up. We're supposed to raise them up. And it says, verse 4 there, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You say, what, what's the importance of this word up? It, it, it's not just talking about bringing, but there's a direction we're supposed to bring them. We're supposed to grow them. We're supposed to increase them, if you will. We're supposed to add to them. We see the same terminology in the book of Proverbs, chapter 22 and verse 6. We said it earlier, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Train up. When your children look at your example, when you, as we read here, bring your children along with you, the question is, are you bringing your children up or are you bringing your children down? It's a wonderful thing to spend time with your children. But spending time with your children, teaching them the bad principles that, that you're disobeying in the Word of God, that's trouble right there. Bring them, but bring them up. Bring them in the right direction. Uh, when it comes to this matter of church attendance, when it comes to reading your Bible, when it comes to Bible memory, memory, when it comes to the commands of God, make sure that you're bringing them in the right direction, not dragging them down. When they come to church and they hear the teaching and they hear the preaching, when they open their word of God and they, they read the scriptures and they see the commands of God, do they then go to their father and see the example that their father sets and that standard drags them down or up? We're supposed to bring them with us, but bring them up are you building your children are you edifying your children we've talked about the meaning of that word edification that edifying that that root of that word is the uh the edifice a, a building and when we talk about edifying it, it, it talks about building up something using the building blocks to you know to put them together to construct them to make them stronger and, and taller and bigger and the question is are you edifying are you building or are you tearing down and I'll say that building something worthwhile doesn't happen on accident. It requires a purposeful, thoughtful plan, just like anything else in life. Great things don't happen. Great things are not accomplished accidentally. I think as a child, uh, we used to enjoy building forts. 
How many of you ever built a fort as a kid, you know? Your idea of a fort has a very different definition as you grow older. It starts out, maybe it's just blankets that are piled in the corner or something. And we used to pin blankets to the top of our, um, to the top of our bunk bed and pull them down and we'd sleep inside and we'd lay things out. And that was our fort. We'd go out in the woods and we'd take random pieces of, of wood and we'd lean them up against the trees and kind of build up, you know, dig holes in the ground. And these were our forts. And, and those forts... They didn't have a blueprint. <laughs> they didn't have a plan. And let's just say that it showed in the construction of those forts. None of those forts lasted long. None of those forts, uh, when, when the rain came, those holes, they were filled with water. When the wind came, those, those boards that we just leaned up against a tree, they were blown back over or somewhere else. You know, those forts that we made without a blueprint, without a purpose, without a plan, if you will, they didn't last very long. And when we raise our children, when we build up our family in the way that the scriptures tell us to, this is not something that we want to last just for a fun time. Well, I'm enjoying my family right now. I had a wonderful time for this weekend. No, we're talking about training our children for the rest of their lives. We want a fort that's going to last. We want a building that is built according to a blueprint and a plan from the word of God. I think of an employer, maybe that has a goal for his company. I've worked for different employers and they've had different levels of training. I've been, uh, I worked at one, that the training went for about four and a half months. You know, that, that training, I went, uh, worked at another one that was a little bit longer than that even. And these employers had a specific plan for their business, how they wanted the work to be carried out. And they had a blueprint even for how they were going to convey that information to a new employee, because they did not want that employ, uh, new employee to come in and, and just wander around and do things however they wanted to. And maybe learn it from a coworker beside him who may or may not be doing it right. They wanted, they wanted to train and prepare them with purpose, with intention, according to a blueprint. And when it comes to the training, when it comes to raising our children, are we doing it with purpose and intention? Are we doing it in such a way that we're bringing them up? In fact, are we instructing our children at all? We live in a society today where parents and children spend so little time even interacting with each other, that there are a lot of parents that are out there, like, well, have you taught this to my child? Well, when he asks me, I'll teach him about this. Have you, have you taught this to your daughter? Well, when, when she brings that up, when she encounters that, I'm sure that we'll have that discussion. Hey, set a plan. Lay these, these principles out that need to be taught. My brother called me a, a couple weeks ago and, and uh, probably two, closer to two months ago now, and he said, I, I wanna make a list of some life skills that I want to teach my sons. And I want you to, to help me make this list. And he said, I, I wanna cover certain things. Yeah, some outdoors things, you know, fishing and hunting and whatever. I wanna go ahead and cover some financial things, how to set up a budget and balance a checkbook and you know, some of these basic things. I wanna, I wanna lay these things out and I don't want these things, and, and he didn't put it this way necessarily, but he didn't want these things to be accidentally, well, if we encounter it, if you see mom and dad balancing the checkbook, you can figure it out. If you see mom and dad but, you know, laying out a budget, you, he wanted to make it sure that it was purposeful in the way that he taught them. He, and is he gonna get to all of them? Probably not, but at least he's got a plan. He's trying to put these things out. And if we have a plan to instruct our children in the principles of the word of God, we're gonna get a whole lot further than those that have no plan. I wanna build up my children. A am I doing it perfectly? No, I'm not. But I wanna make a plan. I wanna have a blueprint. I want to be raising my children up. Are you instructing your child? We read Deuteronomy chapter six, verse six through nine, it says, and these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Talk about the commands of God. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest by the way and when thou liest down and when thou risest up and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. I love that word there. Teach them diligently. Diligently. You think about that. If somebody was to look at the way that we teach our children the principles of the word of God, would they see it and describe it as diligently? Or would they describe it as haphazardly? When I get a chance, as I have opportunity, it has to be a priority. It has to be something that we have a, a plan. And this education of children is the responsibility of parents, and we see here particularly of the father. 
Use the tools that you have around you. Yes, please. Use good books. Use the, the men and women that, that God has put around us in, in, in the church to, to help and to train. Use videos and audio and use a, a good Bible college and send them to camp and, and the things that you have. But fathers, you are the one that is commanded to bring them up. You are to build up your children. You are to add to them. You are to increase them. You are to draw them closer to the Lord. And that's not on the, that is not on the shoulders. That is not the responsibility of anyone else but fathers at its base. Yeah, there are helps, but fathers, it is our responsibility. Fathers, put the scripture into your children. Read them the word of God. Tell them what you read about in your devotions as you read the word of God. Quote scripture to them as you see opportunities throughout the day and you encounter situations that, that reminds me of this verse. That situation there reminds me of this Bible principle, this here. Use those as opportunities wherever you are. Sing the scripture and sing Bible songs in your house. Use the things that you see out and about as illustrations for teaching biblical principles. This has to be intentional. The devil will take our minds and he'll put it on other things. He'll distract us. He'll keep us away from these things. But we have to bring them with us, but not just bring them with us, bring them up. And the question here is, are we teaching and setting the example? We see here, fathers, ye fathers, provoke not your children. Bring them up. Raise them up. I'm going to ask you today, fathers, what will you do with the instruction? We've got instruction here through a whole range of different relationships. And here in this passage, there is instruction that's given specifically to fathers. And the question here is, will you commit yourself to being a godly father? Not one that's ruled by pride. Not one that's ruled by passions. Not pointing your children to some ideal that you aren't even attempting for yourself. Not leaving them to figure things out and bounce around and try to gather truths from the world and society in general, but walking in humility, setting a godly example, building up your children with intention and purpose. Are we going to be fathers that the Bible calls us to be? Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for the very specific instruction that you've given us in the Word of God. Oh, what a blessing it is that we don't have to figure this out, that we don't just have to look to society and, and try and guess at the right way to do this. But Lord, we have the instruction that you've given us. Lord, I pray you would help us to live according to that instruction. May we honor you in these responsibilities that you've given us. We pray this in Jesus' name. <coughs> As the music plays.